it was Passover, the night the nation celebrated how God had miraculously freed them from slavery in Egypt. Gathered with his closest friends, Jesus broke the unleavened bread and passed it around, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he offered the cup, saying, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. The bread and the wine would be the way we would commemorate the sacrifice he was about to become.
stand back up. That would be great. The song is called Man of Sorrows. I think it's very appropriate as we head into this Easter season. Uh, if you know it, sing along. If not, hopefully you can catch on kind of quick. missionary
so troubled within me. Put your trust in God, oh, and sing your praises to him. My hope is in my Savior and my God. Thank you, ladies. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2 this morning. I'm going to take a detour this morning off the normal program that you have in your bulletin. I just felt the Lord calling me to talk about something else this morning. While you're turning there, imagine you're walking through a desert, and you've been walking through that desert for several days, and your canteen's been empty for at least a day and a half. And off in the distance, you see what looks like an old shack. And so you start heading up toward there, hoping that maybe you can find some water because it's getting critical in your life. And as you approach the shack, you see that it's just an old, worn-out shack that some old prospector had. And there's not much to it. But you look around back, and you find an old, rusty pump, a water pump. And on the pump is a note. And it says this, there's plenty of water for all who want to drink. Under the rock, you'll find a jar full of water. You need to take that jar and pour half of it into the well to begin to have the well plump so it begins to work. And then you have to dump the rest of the water into the well. That way you'll have all the water that you want to drink. But you, you can't drink any of it because it takes all the water that's in the jar in order to get all the water that you want. And it was signed by God. Let me ask you this morning, there's a lot of folks today that are thirsty for spiritual things. We have a tendency many times to take the easy way out. We lift up the rock and we take the jar that has water in it and then we just lift it up and we drink it and that's good enough for today. But see, God wants to give us water that flows forever, that continues to flow, where it's always available to you. And I think many times as Christian people, we take the easy road instead of the hard road. I mean, it's a hard choice to make because if that didn't work, and surely look, that old rusty pump wasn't going to work, but if it didn't work and you wasted all that water, you were probably going to die. And I do believe with all my heart that many Christians today are not experiencing the fullness of their life in Christ. They, full up, you know, they pull up their jar every Sunday and they drink it instead of investing it into the, the Lord's work and to trusting Him and to be honest with you, when it comes to our faith, that's what it is. Isn't it? It's nothing but trust. It's to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. You have to believe that God has more for you than what you see. And you've heard me say it so many times that maybe you'll get tired of me saying it sometime. But I'm here to tell you that most Christians never experience the fullness of their faith. Is that you this morning? Are you drinking the water instead of pouring it down into the well to plumb the well so you can get all the water that God wants you to have? Here in Revelation chapter 2, we have the message that Jesus sent to the church at Ephesus. John, the apostle, we've talked about in the past, pastored the church at Ephesus. This church had many, many good things going for it. He begins writing here in verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church at Ephesus, and that would be, most people interpret that to be the pastor, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the seven stars of the seven churches that he's addressing. And so one of the stars, of course, is the church at Ephesus. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your patience, and your labor, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This was a good church, amen? They were doing good things. But then God says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. They had fallen. And Jesus is telling them they need to repent 
from where they have fallen and do the first works again, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What is it that they needed to remember? What was it that this church needed to know that they had forgotten that was going to cause God to walk away from them, to just give their church away so it wouldn't really be part of his family anymore, to let it go? What was it that was so devastating that this church had done? Verse 2 says, I know your works. Their works were good. They had their programs. They had their policies. Things were good. And it says that you cannot bear those which are evil. And so they were preaching the stuff. They were standing up to what God wanted them to do. There was nothing wrong with what they were doing. They tested those who say they are apostles and they are not and have found them to be liars. And so their doctrine was strong. It was a, from all outward appearances, it was a strong church. It was doing everything that perhaps the world said a church needs to be. And sometimes that's how we get. As long as everything looks right on the outside, we're happy with it. And so we'll drink of the jar instead of having the abundance that God wants to have us to have every day. What was it, do you think, that God wanted them to remember? I've been giving that some thought this week. I want you to turn back in your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts 19. In Acts 19, we see where this church was founded. And we see how the church was. And we see those things, perhaps, at least I can see, that we need to remember. That Jesus wants that church to remember. And by them remembering, we need to remember the same. In Acts chapter 19, it says, And it happened when Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what were you baptized? And so they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, in John indeed baptized you with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And the men were about 12 in all. It wasn't a very large church, was it? Just 12 men, some children, and probably some women there too. And then it goes down a little bit further. Let me just continue to read. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. You know, we live in a world today where people don't want to hear what the scriptures had to say. Aubrey and I had a moment to witness to a 90-year-old man recently. And he said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I believe in what I believe. You believe in what you believe. You just keep it to yourself and I'll be happy. People are that way. We need to learn to contend with the faith, to continue, to continue, to continue to present the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives living water to the world. Verse 9 says, But when some were hardened and did not believe, they spoke evil of the way before the multitude. Christianity, the church, the young church was called the way. He departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So he continued to reason with these folks about the truth of Christianity. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelled in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who, were, who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Shiva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? When the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them, fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Why? Because Paul had power. The Jesus that he preached 
had the power to control the demons and cast them out. Verse 18, And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it was told with 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Now, as Paul, this is his second missionary journey, as he's going, he goes to Ephesus and begins to plant this church. As he did, he went to the synagogues and began to preach. And people were hearing the gospel. People came to know Jesus Christ. There's power in the Word of God. You believe that, don't you? That's why we go. We go out and we tell people what the gospel says, what the Bible says. We don't save anybody, but we present the gospel to them so the Holy Spirit can use that to convict their hearts. What was it? that caused this church to be so different at one time and to be lacking later in life. Look at verse 17. It says, This became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in, in Ephesus. They realized exactly who Jesus was and what he had been preaching. And something began to happen to the church. It says, The name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. We exist as a church for one purpose and one purpose only. The purpose of the church is to magnify the Lord Jesus. We do it in many different ways, but that's why we've gathered here today. Not simply to sing songs or to sing choruses that the girls led us in, but to, to lift up our hearts and our hands to praise of God and to magnify His name, to worship Him, to praise Him. That's what we are. That's what we do because of who we are. We worship Him. And so this church at Ephesus, they were magnifying God. The question that we have to have put before us this morning before we partake of communion is this. Are you magnifying God with your life? Or are you simply saying that jar of water is simply enough for me? Are you ready to walk by faith and dump it all into the well to see what the Lord can have for you? To walk by faith and not by sight. When they began to see what the Lord Jesus was doing, they began to magnify the Lord's name. Verse 18 says, And many who had believed confessing, came confessing and telling their deeds. The idea there is telling their sinful deeds. Something was happening to this church. You know what was happening to this church? It was revival was happening to this church. Even though it was a young church, even though they were, later on they were doing good things, they realized who God was and they began to magnify God. When you begin to magnify God, it begins to show you your sinfulness. Isn't that true? You see how sinful you are, how sinful we are. How sinful I are. I sounded good when I said it, you know. How sinful I am. That's what the Word of God does. It convicts us. And when we understand who God is and we, we come into His presence and worship and filled with the water of His Spirit, we want to confess our deeds. God, I have sinned against you. And that's exactly what we do at communion, isn't it? We examine ourselves. Self-introspection. Lord, Search my heart and tell me those things that keeps me from magnifying you in my life. What are things in my life, God, that I'm disobedient in? It could be simple things like reading the Scriptures. Because through the Scriptures, we learn who Jesus is. We learn what Christianity is. We learn what God desires of us. And as we grow in that relationship of who He is to know Him, it leads us into the aspect of magnifying Him, which is prayer and worship and praise. Do you do that? Is praise and worship missing from your life? I know you do it on Sunday because you're here. What about on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday? Do you have that desire to magnify His name? And, and when you're in that presence, you begin to confess things that you know don't please Him because you know who He is and you desire Him. And this church, because they were magnifying the Lord, they began to confess their deeds and telling their deeds, confessing them. Guess what I did last week? They didn't care what other people thought. All they cared about was being right with God. That's what communion is. Are you right with God? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praising God? Are you worshiping God? What's your prayer life like? You can take communion all you want to, but if your heart's not right, you're not magnifying God. And by the way, we'll look at it in a little bit in 1 Corinthians 11. It says if you do that in a way that's improper, you eat and drink judgment to yourself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, God judges you. You see, sometimes we don't believe that we serve a God who does those type of things. You know, we have a God in a book instead of a real God who can do things to us. 
Well, God wouldn't do anything to me. God doesn't want to do anything to you. God loves you. We kind of look at God and he's waiting to get us. That's not how God is. But God will chasten his own. God wants you to be right. God wants you to magnify him. God wants you to glorify him. God saved you for the purpose of doing that. And then it says in verse 19, the second thing that they were, what we see happening to the early church here, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Wow, imagine that. They cleaned out all the trash that was in their house. Books of magic. Today we could say pornography and things like that. They got rid of all those things because their heart's desire was to magnify God, to glorify God, to come into that presence and be overwhelmed by a living, true God. And so they brought their books and they began to burn their books. And how many does it say? How much did it cost? 50,000 pieces of silver. I have read, I don't know for sure, but I have read that's $50 million today. I'm sorry, $5 million today. You can give me the extra. Think about that. Their heart's desire was to throw their money away in that sense so they could be right with God. Your money comes from God anyway. You realize that. Everything that you have, I've said this to you so many times before, everything you have today comes to you from God. He gives you those things that you might serve Him, that you might magnify Him with the life that He's given to you. He saved you in this life, at this time, at this place, so you can serve Him. So your job... The clothes and things that he gives to you are for the purpose of serving him because you, my friend, were bought with a price. You don't own yourself anymore. It's not your choice. And so we go into all the world when we preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because we're compelled to do that. Why? Because we want to magnify God. And in that magnification, sometimes we see our sinfulness and we, we want to confess those things and, and let those things go from us. And just to bask in his glory. And then it says, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I'm here to tell you, when a church begins to really magnify God, something happens. People call it revival. But I think the way it says it here in verse 20 is probably the best. So the word of the Lord grew. How did it grow? It grew mightily and it prevailed. Among who? Go back to verse 17, the Jews and the Greeks, the people that they were preaching the gospel to. Is that your desire to see God's glory prevail? To see the word of God prevail? To see people fill up these seats that we have empty around us? It isn't so much to fill up the seats. I don't care about filling up the seats. What I do care about is people hearing the gospel and magnifying God. And it starts with us here today. And so Jesus tells the church at Ephesus, and they were doing all these different things. They had all their programs, their doctrines. Everything was right. But he says, hey... Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Their first love was to magnify this one that they loved. They had given everything to him because they were bought with a price. We've taken so many things back from God. And we look at the things that we have and we say, well, God, we don't even thank God for those things. We just have them. But you have to realize everything you have is his. He says, remember wherefore you have fallen. Remember how you used to magnify God, how you used to pray, how you used to read the scriptures, how you had that desire to know and you wanted to uplift him, to magnify him, to worship and praise him. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not just to sit in the chair, but to be excited about who God is and the life he's given to you. And looking forward, yes, looking forward to that time when you walk into his presence and be overwhelmed by the light of God. That's exciting. That's exciting, but we've lost that excitement. The church at Ephesus was doing all these different things, but they lost that excitement. They lost the ability to magnify his name. He tells them, remember. Remember. And do the first works again. And so you have to remember, and then you have to repent. One of the things that we have is we have communion. We have that time of introspection. You examine your heart and you confess your sins. You don't want anything to hamper your fellowship with God. That's what this is all about. Once a month, we have the opportunity to look at ourselves and see how our Christian walk really is. And so often we'll just kind of gloss over it. Oh, my Christian life's okay. Is it? You have to let the Holy Spirit examine your heart. 
And if you're like me, and I'm sure you are, your heart isn't always right. So you examine your life, you confess your sins, you confess those deeds, and you go back to having that desire to magnify His name. Because when you magnify His name, the Word of God is going to be shed abroad. Why? Because you're going to be taking it. Because you're excited about who God is. And you can't contain it. God can't be contained in a church. God can't be contained in a person. God's everywhere. And so you have to remember how it was. And you have to repent of those things and go back and do those first works or he will come and remove you. And that's what it says as we look at 1 Corinthians. If you eat and drink in an unworthy way, you eateth and drinketh damnation, it says, or judgment not discerning this Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak, many are sick, and many are dead. Why? Because you didn't repent. Change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. I'm here to tell you, I do believe there are so many Christians in the lifetime that I have stood in these pulpits and preached to, to people about Jesus Christ. I see people who settle for such a meager Christianity, something simple, when they could have the, the flood of the water of the Spirit of God. May I suggest to you one of the things that we do is that we stifle the Spirit of God. We don't allow the Spirit of God to consume us and fill us because when He has a, a hold of us, what happens to us? We want to magnify God. What's it say when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you sing songs and praises to God? Why? It's just how it works. Oh, beloved, is it in your life today, do you have the magnification of God on your heart, the praise of God in your mouth and on your lips, a desire to shed the Word of God wherever you go? That's Christianity. That's what God wants. So when you get to that pump and it's all rusty and you got that water and you say, well, I could just drink this, I challenge you today to dump it in the pump and prime the pump and see what God will have for you. But you've got to walk by faith. You've got to walk by faith because that's what the Christian life is. It's walking by faith. But when you walk by faith, God changes you and God transforms you and you come into his presence, and I'm here to tell you, there's nothing like it. I mean, if I can magnify God, and I know I'm just an old sinner who's been saved by God's grace, but I'm a saint today. If I can do it, you can do it. Because there's nothing greater than simply praising God and magnifying God and knowing who he is. It broke my heart, Aubrey, to talk to that man who's going to go to hell, and he didn't care one way or the other. It's got to break all of our hearts. We've got to go and tell. Why? Because I want to magnify God in my life and in my spirit, which are God's anyway. And so as you partake of communion today, ask yourself that. Are you drinking from the, the glass or are you simply pumping the pump? A little bit more to that story. It says, after you get the water out of the pump, fill the jar back up and put it back under the rock for the next guy who's coming down the road. Are we doing that? Are you doing that? You know, communion is a time when it's just you and me and the Lord. Really, communion is a time when it's not just you and me. It's just you and the Lord. It's me and the Lord. Are you full of his water? Are you full of His presence, His Spirit? Are you magnifying God? Are you just overwhelmed by His glory? Beloved, if you are, praise God. Keep pumping that pump. And if you're not, then prime that pump and quit drinking out of the glass. And see what God has for you. Let's pray. Let me have the deacons come forward. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have this morning to realize that you have so much more for us. Oh, God, it's exciting to be a Christian. It's exciting to be saved. It's exciting to be able to go out and share that mighty message that even demons listen to, God, that you can transform people. God, transform us today. Help us to be people that we can't get enough of you. Help us, Father, to drink from the well that never runs dry. Oh, God, help us to be different. Help us to take that step of faith and step out in faith. 
and see what you can actually do to a person that is totally relying upon you. Oh God, you are such a great God and we are so unworthy to be your children. But God, we thank you this morning for your love. You loved us, God. Jesus died for us, Lord. And here today, during this little memorial service, we remember what he did for us. And Lord, help us to not just be remembering and while we sit here today or in our minds today, but as we leave this place, we remember what he's done for us. And maybe we just continue to repent that you, Father God, might be magnified. Lord, we love you. Fill us now with your presence and your spirit as we partake of communion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.